The August release of Home Assistant is due on Wednesday the 7th of August and so as usual in this video I'm going to go through some of the features that are available based on the 2024.8 beta release. Because it's based on the beta release some things might change between the beta and the main release. There are a variety of updates this month from dashboard card editions to re-architecting and some local AI integration for the Home Assistant Voice Assistant. If you haven't watched my channel before, then my name is Mark and I review smart home products taking particular interest with Home Assistant and Matter products. I also try to keep you up to date on all the Home Assistant bits and bobs that go on and create some tutorials for you guys to watch. I've got lots of things planned over the next few months, but in the meantime, let's go through the latest features of this Home Assistant release. One change for this month is a big change whilst at the same time not really being a change at all and that is that service calls are no longer a thing in Home Assistant. They are now called actions instead. You might have noticed a few releases ago that automations had the action terminology introduced and so this is now just carrying that theme throughout everything in Home Assistant. The word action is much more of a user friendly name and probably better describes its actual purpose. It's also fairly universal to use the word action action with both Google Home and Amazon using these words in various places for their automations. If you still create automations using YAML then it's recommended to use the action word instead of the service word going forwards but both will continue to work so you don't need to go and amend all of your YAML automations. Another change that is more behind the scenes is that the ZHA Zigbee integration has had a code reorganized, allowing it to be more maintainable going forwards. They actually included quite an interesting graph in the release notes showing how many lines of code some of the integrations had. Now let's move on to a change which is a bit more fun and particularly useful for those of you who like to have local rather than cloud integrations. A couple of releases ago I showed you that you can now ask ChatGPT to give you answers to general knowledge questions whilst also being able to give commands to control your smart home. What's the average height of a cow and turn off the left light? The left light has been turned off. The average height of a cow is about 4.7 to 5.2 feet at the shoulder. This capability was also added for Google AI, but for this release you can now use the local Alarma AI engine instead. The tests that they've performed indicate that it's not quite as accurate as OpenAI or as Google, and themselves they aren't really actually perfect in my experience but you can be pretty sure that they're going to improve these in the future. So keep an eye out for that and if you get the time give Alarma a try. For this release they have added a couple of basic assist features. You can now ask it the date and the time which you couldn't do previously and you can also now set timers using assist on your phone. Set a timer for five seconds. timer is set for five seconds. I found that I had to update the Home Assistant companion app on my phone before timers would actually work. So if you get this issue then make sure that you are on the latest version. The dashboard excitement also continues for this release. If you've been using Home Assistant for a while then you may well have come across some custom cards for your dashboard called mushroom cards. One of these cards is called the chips card which is really convenient for displaying little bits of information without taking much space on your dashboard. One of the things that I use them for is for displaying whether it's bin week or recycling week. They're also good for things that are quite transient and so may not need to be shown all of the time. Home Assistant native supports a similar thing called badges which has been in Home Assistant forever but they are pretty ugly and I've not used them for years. They now have the same design as the chips mushroom card but they are specifically designed for going at the top of your dashboard so if you edit a dashboard you will see a new section at the top which allows you to add these badges for any entities that you want to. You can also go to the visibility tab and set conditions for when they are visible just like you can for the other cards and the other sections within the sections view. 
If you're not using the sections view, then you can also take advantage of this new functionality. But in my opinion, there's no reason not to switch to the new sections view. They are still classified as experimental, but I've not had any issues with any of them across Android, iOS, or on the desktop. I would like to see more of these types of cards baked into Home Assistant in the future by default, in particular the Mushroom Chips card, and also the really powerful Auto Entities Custom Card, which allows you to show entities based on lots of different conditions. It's basically a supercharged version of the Visibility tab. So if you haven't used this card before, then I really recommend that you check it out. The next change is a little addition to the recent data table improvements, which now allows you to sort by date modified or date created. I could see this being quite useful for finding all of the recently updated entities, and also maybe even clearing out some of the old and used ones. You just need to go to the cog in the top right and make sure that those fields are visible by clicking the little eye icon. You'll have to do it separately for the devices and the entities tables. The next change is for the matter integration. Because the standard is still relatively young, you're probably going to see quite a lot of updates for at least the next couple of years as the standard still matures. This release has built the framework to allow you to update the firmware on your matter devices from within Home Assistant which is one really good step forwards to not needing multiple apps on your phone. This very much depends on the manufacturers though, so I'll be interested to see how many actually adopt this. For me, I'm hoping that Akar and SwitchBot do this because I've got quite a few of their devices. I'm also hoping that in the future there will be similar standards for commissioning of devices as well, because at the moment it's great that your devices can communicate locally without the internet using matter, but for most products I've set up recently, such as smart locks and robot vacuums, the manufacturer's app is still required to set up the device and change many of the settings. So my smartphone is still littered with various different smart home apps. It also means that if the company goes bust, then your device might still become a doorstop because if you need to reconfigure it or change some settings, then you're not going to be able to without using their app. Now, going back to a quality of life change for this release, one of the things that the Home Assistant team has been working hard to reduce is the need to use YAML, unless it's a complex operation. I spent a very long time moving my helpers from YAML into the UI, and the Home Assistant team has spent a very, very long time moving all of the integrations from YAML into the UI. They've still got some to go, and so for this release, what they've done is, is they allow you to see all of the ones that you've set up in YAML in the UI. So this is for helpers and for integrations. You just need to look for the little icon which shows two parentheses. You still won't be able to amend them in the UI, but at least you know the integrations exist and that you'll be able to hopefully move them over over time. For this release, we also have two lists of noteworthy changes, each of which has about 10 items on it and a similar amount of new integrations as well. So I'm certainly not going to go through them all here, but there's just a few that caught my eye that I'll talk about. If you use the HomeKit bridge integration to share your Home Assistant devices with Apple Home, then you can now have access to doorbell and motion events. The integrations themselves actually need to obviously support this functionality, but in this release they have actually added this already for Unify Protect, for Doorbird and for the August integrations. And whilst we're talking about doorbells you can now also control the chime of your Reolink doorbell. The WLED integration for controlling LED lights now supports color temperature CCT LED strips and if you do use the OpenAI integration, it now defaults to a better and cheaper language model. I already changed this myself last month because I was previously using the ChatGPT 3.5 model, but it's good to know now that it defaults to GPT-4 Mini instead. And also for this month, the Tessie integration has popped up once again, giving you access to even more sensor data for your Tesla car. Now, if you made it this far through the video, then you might be pleased because actually the next one I think is quite a good addition. I use helpers in Home Assistant all of the time and occasionally use template helpers for performing some calculations, but you could only use them for binary sensors and for sensors. There are now four new options available in the UI for the template helpers. For example, the button one allows you to create a template for a button, but instead of having to create an automation then, so actually 
actually does something, you can now actually define the button actions when you're setting up the helper, which I think is great. You can also do a similar thing for the select template. Not only can you define the options here, but again, you can define what happens when an option is selected. And whilst we're talking about helpers, the group helper now allows you to create groups for the notify entities and for button entities as well. I can see the notify one being useful if you want to send the same notification to multiple people within your family. Then you could just call this group rather than all the different entities. If you use the KNX ecosystem, then you probably already know that it has a home assistant integration which allows you to integrate lots of different products. This release has given it a nice new front end in Home Assistant so that you can manage your KNX entities from within Home Assistant. In terms of new integrations, there is a new Tesla integration. I haven't looked at what the difference is between this one and Tessie, for example, but at first glance, it looks like you can manage more things. So if you've got other Tesla products, such as their Powerwall or their solar setup, then it's worth taking a look at this integration. You know that the world has officially gone mad when you start integrating things such as a soldering iron into your smart home. But here we are. For this release, you can integrate certain soldering irons into Home Assistant and you can view things then like the temperature. I try to cover most of the big changes of a release as best as possible, but there are definitely a lot of things in this release that I haven't mentioned in this video. So as always, make sure that you check out the release notes before upgrading your system. And thanks until next time.